Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone who came out and for this kind invitation. It is always fun to come back to Illinois. I grew up in Rock Island in the Quad Cities, for those of you who know where that is, and then spent an enjoyable time in uh, this wealthy and wonderful part of the world. Um, I hear you've had uh, a good winter. Um, I don't know if you if you broke the record of 1978, but that was the winter I was courting my now wife, and as as of that time and for many years afterwards, that stood as the most snowfall that Chicago land had ever gotten. So um, it must be ready for a record breaking. Um, we had our record-breaking blizzard in April of 2003, and that was kind of fun to be snowed in for a week. Fun in a strange way. But uh, um, that's not why I'm here, to talk about snow, um, but to talk about a topic that I suppose we all shy away from to one degree or another. Um, I find that when churches in my part of the world want uh, some teaching on money, they look to invite a guest speaker, um, and I sometimes get tabbed, and I've begun to think of this as a kind of hit-and-run ministry, um, <laughs> and leave others to pick up the pieces. <laughs> But uh, as you can see from uh, the notes, I have uh, extensive material. No, that does not mean I'm going to talk more than an hour. I will stop um, at the appointed time, but I wanted you to have uh, some rather full, uh, detailed references to take away from you. Uh, if you haven't already bought one of my books, now you don't need to. Um, because this is the heart of it right here. And uh, the whole point is uh, not to spend money on something you don't need to spend it on. So don't spend it on my books. Um, at least not on this topic. You may be familiar with the uh, series that uh, Don Carson right here from Trinity back in the mid-90s uh, conceived that has now uh, produced uh, a number of volumes called New Studies in Biblical Theology. And it really was Don's conviction that uh, there was a dearth of uh, academic works uh, in the evangelical world recently that would take a given theme and study it over a, a considerable sweep of the biblical story. And so uh, this is uh, about as big a sweep as you can get from Genesis to Revelation and uh, a topic which uh, we all know there's plenty written on, but often from uh, seemingly imbalanced perspectives from the prosperity gospel on one hand to uh, perhaps a call for extreme asceticism on the other and what does the Bible really teach, and what are we supposed to do with it? So we're leaving uh, a half an hour for questions. Uh, do be thinking of them. Uh, don't promise to be able to answer them, but uh, if I can't, I'm sure somebody else here will. Um, and with that uh, introduction, we want to just take a, a whirlwind tour some of you may have used the walk through the Bible materials. Well, this is going to be a sprint through. Um, what are some of the highlights that we have to take into account on a biblical theology of material possessions? So to begin at the beginning, I think it's very important that we take account of the fact that unlike the teachings of some world religions and worldviews, Judaism and Christianity after it, taught that God created the material world good and humans as very good. There is nothing inherently evil 
about matter or material possessions. In fact, it was designed as a good gift for humanity and for man and woman to be the stewards of it. But you also know you only have to read to the third chapter of Genesis and we come to the account of the fall and the sin of Adam and Eve and the corruption that extends from that also to the entire universe, including the material world. So that the rest of the Bible is the story of God's desired plan of redeeming not just sinful humans, but uh, the entire cosmos. And you know that that story really begins in earnest in Genesis 12, when he selects Abram and determines to make uh, a great nation from his descendants, but a nation through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It is from the ancient patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and if we put Job somewhere back at that early period, that we get multiple models of extremely rich people blessed by God, more often than not uh, in God's favor. So again... Nothing inherently wrong with wealth. We also, however, see, often tucked into the fine print, as it were, that each of those wealthy patriarchs uses his wealth very generously, often sacrificially, often to help the needier people. Fast forward to Exodus and the giving of the law, and we begin to get didactic and explicit instructional teaching on what God's people should do with wealth. Once again, there are laws that stress that private property is good. And uh, Numbers 26 outlines the principle that those with larger families, larger clans, greater needs should have more land, should have more possessions. It's proportional. But intriguingly, for every law or passage in the Torah that speaks about the goodness of material possessions, there are four or five that create safeguards against its misuse. The whole sacrificial system, we don't often think of it in that sense. Yes, it was designed provisionally for the forgiveness of sins, but it was also to be the costliest, the best, the unblemished. Uh, there's a reason a sacrifice was called a sacrifice. <laughs> or maybe a better way of putting that is there's a reason that both of those meanings carry over into the English word. It cost somebody something to give it up. They couldn't use it for other purposes. There are intriguing laws in the Old Testament against charging interest on loans, except with foreigners, which has uh, a spotted history throughout Jewish and Christian application, but seems originally to have been because Laws among the uh, loans among the Israelites were given merely to help the poor and indebted get out of their circumstances, whereas anything at all approaching what we might call commercial loans was done only in the context of trading with other nations, all of which has to be taken into account as we seek contemporary application. There were restrictions on how much people could earn. And we don't think of the Sabbath from that perspective all the time as well, but it, it cut by one-seventh someone's uh, earning capacity, as well as the sabbatical year and the jubilee year. Whether or not it was ever practiced, a great mystery, but the intention was a kind of ancient equivalent to one free get-out-of-bankruptcy card for the Monopoly game of life in a lifetime. 
There were taxes for the temple upkeep. There were tithes, 10% to go to uh, the priests and Levites for the upkeep of the temple and worship there, 10% to go to creating the festivals on an annual basis that the people could enjoy as well, and three and a third percent to go to the poor. And then all kinds of other laws uh, about the poor, the alien and sojourner in the land who were not to be mistreated, um, and on and on. Of course, the... uh, Israelites didn't get to start their society and implement these laws uh, as quickly as the original design was. Uh, They wound up through their disobedience, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And you wouldn't expect that very unique and provisional period of time to give us timeless principles, except that Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 thinks there's at least one of them that functions in that role. And that's when he cites the manna economy, as it has been called, that everyone gathered as much as they were able. And as a result, somehow, miraculously perhaps, no one had too much and no one had too little. It wasn't a situation of absolute equality, either of need or of uh, income. But it did acknowledge that there was such a thing as too much. And it did acknowledge that there was such a thing as too little and that those with the surplus should help those with too little. And Paul thinks that much, at least, can be applied to the New Testament age as well. Now, if we summarize, as we have to, if we're going to make any progress in this sprint, a large swath of the Old Testament all at once, uh, say Deuteronomy through Esther. (laughs) Basically, uh, it boils down to the unique covenant made with the children of Israel, contingent in part on their obedience to Torah, so that to the extent that any given generation, and particularly her leadership, was largely obedient to God and his laws, they would be blessed, and blessed materially, with life in the land, with good harvests, with peace from surrounding enemies, And to the extent that uh, generation was more disobedient than not, and particularly her leadership, after a period of patient waiting for repentance, God would then bring judgment, which included harvests that were not adequate, which included uh, wars with uh, surrounding enemies, and in extreme cases, We know in the Assyrian and Babylonian days, exile of a large number of the key leaders in Israel. It's these broad principles of material blessing for obedience and material dispossession for disobedience that are so often cited by proponents of the prosperity gospel without noticing three key caveats. A, God made no similar covenant with the surrounding nations, and there's no indication in the New Testament that this part of the covenant with Israel carries over to the church. B, even with Israel, it was a generalization that didn't apply rigidly to every person, and even to the extent that uh, it did apply, it was more often than not about the nation corporately rather than about my personal wealth or lack thereof. So there's a trinity of reasons, (laughs) good metaphor to use at this place, 
um, for not using that the way the prosperity gospelers use it. What about the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, other smaller books of wisdom? Lots of texts. Summing them all up, on the one hand, there are times, personally, when people work hard and God rewards them with material wealth. And some of that is for them to enjoy. There is a biblical basis to the Calvinist-slash-Puritan-slash-Protestant work ethic. It's not all biblical when taken to some extremes, but there's a definite core there. But these books know as well that there are rich people who have gotten rich due to wicked and deceptive scheming. These books know quite well that there are poor people who have been godly and have not been materially blessed. So there's no blanket promise to anyone here. In fact, uh, another passage that you would think would be about the least likely candidate for timeless principles comes tucked in the little-known second-to-the-last chapter of Proverbs, the sayings of Agur, son of Yake, and that's the extent of what we know about Agur and Yake. In verses uh, 7 through 9, Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, But give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Is that a golden mean? Is that the biblical justification for the middle class? (laughs) Probably not. Because he says, give me only my daily bread. (laughs) We want and get a whole lot more. But most commentators suspect that that text was in the back of Jesus' mind when in the Lord's Prayer he taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. So there must be some timeless carryover to other cultures, including ours, which is what we want to wrestle with. The final big chunk of the Old Testament, of course, is the prophets. On this topic, one can ransack them looking for texts that teach uh, both about what Israel did wrong as well as about how she was to rectify the situation. And certainly part of her idolatry involved uh, the worship of material goods and even costly idols. There's that... uh, terrifying chapter in Jeremiah 7 where the people take refuge in the temple crying out the temple of the Lord repeatedly and the reply is uh, in essence uh, huddling in God's house is meaningless if you are overlooking the uh, injustice that you are perpetrating even on your own people and of course we all know Amos with uh, his uh, tirades against the cows of Bashan. And no, there is absolutely nothing in ancient Hebrew to suggest that that was somehow a covert compliment that we no longer understand. Um, (laughs) And it wasn't just the wealthy women, it was uh, their husbands as well who neglected uh, the poor and the ostracized right around them. And then there is, of course, Micah's uh, amazing comment uh, lambasting those who uh, prophesy for a bribe or who do other forms of ministry for the primary purpose of becoming well-to-do. So conversely, Israel needs to seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with her God. 
and to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That doesn't necessarily carry over into the New Testament age, as we will see, but uh, the principle of being generous certainly does. To lament her sins. (laughs) Jeremiah wrote a whole book that became entitled Lamentations. And then in a very unique verse in Jeremiah, during uh, the exile in Babylon, to seek the welfare of the city, the capital city of the evil empire. Because as the city prospers, you will prosper. Almost an Old Testament equivalent to being the salt of the earth and light of the world. Even in the heart of the enemy capital. Do good. Do good socially. Do good economically. Because you too will benefit from that. But above all, look to the end. Look to the messianic age. Look to the time when God will recreate the cosmos. And it's the end of Isaiah that first introduces us to the concept of new heavens and new earth that will be so formative for John the Apostle in writing the book of Revelation. So there's three quarters of the Bible in uh, 20 minutes. Not too bad. Maybe 23 What about the New Testament, which, as my Old Testament colleagues always reminds me, gets a whole lot more than one quarter of our attention? (laughs) And they lament that fact. Well, if we start with Jesus' teaching, a very good place to start. Blessed are the poor. Oh, we love Matthew's version because it says poor in spirit, but let's not forget Luke's where it's the literally poor. And there's no contradiction because the underlying Hebrew used in Isaiah and used in a number of places is the anawim, which was both and, as Grant Osborne taught me so well 30 years ago, and it stayed with me. I do both and whenever possible. Um, It's those who were God's people who were pious, but they were also in many instances, economically destitute or impoverished. Give to the one who begs from you. And it was Augustine who says, but Jesus didn't say what to give. (laughs) Give intelligently, but seek their help. Seek their best interest. Give alms, not in a way that uh, parades your piety before people. But that doesn't mean that not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing or vice versa means having uh, economic administration in shambles at your church. (laughs) Because back in being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, we're meant to model before a watching world the right way to do things. Give us this day our daily bread. We've already mentioned that. Lay up treasures in heaven. Rather than on earth, spiritual riches. But on the other hand, ask and you will receive. (laughs) But not as the carte blanche that taken all by itself, that verse might suggest. Matthew imagined that when he wrote what we call chapter 7, we would have already read and remembered chapter 6, where the Lord's prayer was, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and sometimes it's not his will to give us the new Lexus, and we shouldn't have been asking in the first place. The Lord is upon me, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, the freeing of the oppressed, the year of the Lord's favor. It's a holistic salvation that's promised there in Isaiah that Jesus says he's come to fulfill that involves both spiritual and material liberation. And there's the assumption that God's people will continue to give alms, to give offerings for the poor. In Matthew uh, chapter 11, uh, excuse me, in in, uh, 
just lost my place. In Matthew 23 and Luke chapter 11, um, there is the assumption as Jesus speaks to the Jewish leaders that they will tithe, but the problem is they've been scrupulously tithing minor herbs from their garden and neglecting the major elements of justice and mercy. But that still is before the cross. That still is before the establishment of the church from Pentecost onward. And, and you don't have to be a dispensationalist to say, and I'm not, to, to recognize that, of course, while the law was the system of God's will, that's what Jesus would say to the Jewish leaders. But we can infer nothing one way or the other from that about whether it will continue to be the way for God's people on the other side of the cross. We have to keep on going. Jesus hints at some coming changes with reference to the temple tax when he pays it in an extraordinarily creative way. <laughs> He'll catch a fish and use the coin in his mouth because he says the, the sons of the kingdom should be free, should be exempt from taxation. And the angels agree. I hear the music. Um, when asked about taxes, yes, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God what is God's, and those aren't equal. God's allegiance commands far much more than Caesar's. And then all kinds of parables in which financial imagery appears, and you know them, you can look them up at your leisure, but even if we look just at the last three that are mentioned there, very interesting triad. Each one has often been misinterpreted. The rich fool, the man who had an unexpected bumper crop, and so he built uh, bigger holding tanks. And uh, at first glance, you say, well, that's just being a responsible entrepreneur. But eight times in the passage, he says, I will do this and I will do that. And in a world where 70 to 80 percent of all the people around him were eking out a marginal existence, strikingly absent is any thought of anybody else benefiting from this unexpected surplus. And so the end of the parable has Jesus saying, uh, this night your soul will be required of you. And clearly the man is portrayed as not being rich toward God. He doesn't have a relationship with God, but the way we know that is through his lack of stewardship. The unjust steward, all kinds of interpretive puzzles surrounding that parable, but at the end, in the verse that is the oddest of all, verse 9, Jesus says, therefore make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon, Today we might say filthy lucre, an idiom for all money, all material possessions, not just ill-gotten gain, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal habitations. <laughs> Translated into 21st century English, use your material possessions for kingdom work to make disciples so that when you die, those who have preceded you into God's presence will welcome you. And thank you for the role your resources played in their conversion and or growth in Christ. And the third in the trio is the rich man and Lazarus. At first glance, it uh, seems like this is salvation by socioeconomic bracket. <laughs> if you're poor, you're saved. If you're filthy rich, you're lost. But in verse 30, the second to the last verse of the passage is a key hint. When the man begs that Abraham send someone to warn his brothers who are still alive so that they might repent. Implication, he had never repented. He had never become right with God. <laughs> so he can breathe a sigh of relief. It is really still salvation by uh, a relationship with God. But again, what illustrated that? What tipped off the man's lack? Dining sumptuously every day with no thought even to push a few crumbs in a direction of a beggar closely 
within reach. And Luke, who does more with this topic among the gospel writers than any, has a very interesting trio of texts, two of them unique to his gospel, near the end of chapter 18 and then the first two passages in chapter 19, which probably form a good reminder that we're not being given any formula as to how to address people's needs. There is diversity right within this trio, right within this triad. The rich young ruler is commanded to give up all, and he is the only one in the entire Bible to whom such a command is given. (laughs) And we all breathe a sigh of relief. And one commentator says, but the people who breathe that sigh of relief too quickly are precisely those God would be calling to do the same thing. (laughs) But then we come to Zacchaeus, who gives up half and voluntarily promises to restore fourfold those whom he has defrauded. Hmm. Well, it's better than 100%, but I may not be too relieved yet until I get to the parable of pounds, which is almost capitalist. Uh, The servants who are told to make more money. Hallelujah. And... Also remember that it's all the masters and they will be given an opportunity to give an account for how they have used it. But the models differ. The broader principles remain the same. Ah, but how about that lavish anointing of Jesus? Got to take it into account. It's there. There is time for costly, lavish outpouring of devotion to Christ. But that's not the norm. That happens twice in the Gospels in different contexts. <clears throat> the norm is probably best summarized by the so-called parable of the sheep and the goats, a regular concern for the least and last and lost. So that Jesus on the road to the cross asks the poignant rhetorical question with his disciples following him, what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world but lose their very soul? And he commends the widow's gift, small though it was, as uh, proportionately so much better a gift than uh, that of the well-to-do Jewish leaders. How did Christians imitate their Lord? Yes, that's the transition to page three. I heard those flips. Well, the same slice of Americans who rejoice at Jesus' proto-capitalism in the parable of the pounds gets very nervous about the proto-communism of uh, Acts 2 and 4 and 5. There's really no need to. This is not communism in the modern sense of uh, legislating morality as one group of people understands it and yet leaving God out of the picture, in fact, forcing God out of the picture. This comes as the natural outgrowth of Christian worship. Acts 2.42 is that classic foundational text that talks about what the first disciples did daily, uh, meeting from house to house and weekly as they gathered in the temple courts, which included prayer, which included listening to the apostles' teaching, which included breaking of bread, and koinonia, fellowship. But oh my, that koinonia was so much more than coffee and goodies in the lobby much as I'm grateful of them, for them. It was sharing with fellow Christian brothers and sisters who had acute financial needs. And it was setting up a mechanism for doing so. Occasionally, uh, somebody got helped by a miracle, like Peter and John with the temple beggar. But the more regular pattern, we're told, is that from time to time, as there was need... 
The NIV there simply overinterprets an iterative imperfect in the Greek that meant customarily, this is what they did. Someone with surplus property would sell it. Barnabas, we know him as the son of encouragement. We often forget that the place we're first introduced to him and told about his nickname is because he sold a field and encouraged a whole lot of people by giving the proceeds to the apostles who could distribute them to the needy. Ananias and Sapphira, the first holy zapping of the new covenant. Very reminiscent of Achan in Old Testament times. Probably deliberately so, because at the beginning of each covenant community, it was more crucial than ever that key division caused by disobedience not be introduced. Thank God he's not into regular holy zapping. But again, that's easily misinterpreted. No, they were not condemned for not giving. They were not condemned for not giving everything. They were condemned for not giving what they said they were giving, for lying to people in a way that was lying to God's Spirit himself. It all remains voluntary. Not modern communism. But it also remains crucial. A very different model appears in Acts 6. Communist fears can relax. Here uh, is the original, quote, deacon's fund, close quote. Needy people being overlooked from among the Hellenistic Jews who had become followers of Jesus after Pentecost, and so indigenous leadership is chosen to help meet those needs and not distract the apostles, not overburden them from their, quote, unquote, more spiritual roles. That's another way to provide help. We'll see a third way to provide help if we skip down to Agabus and the famine relief. Take up a collection. That's the one we do best at imitating today. The point is concern for the poor. The mechanisms vary. In between, we're reminded from Peter's harsh words to Simon the magician not to try to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. (sighs) What are some of those prayer rugs they try to sell you on certain TV shows? Uh, Maybe that only happens in Colorado. Tabitha and Cornelius, an insider and an outsider to the Jewish community, are praised for giving to the poor. And in ways that we often don't think of as we read through the latter chapters of Acts, uh, Paul exorcises a young woman at Philippi. And why do people get upset? Because she's converting to Christ? No. (laughs) Because her owner's means of earning a living has evaporated. Paul uh, seeks not to be a burden to those among whom he ministers, and in a a world of uh, patronage and of reciprocity, is very concerned that no one give a gift in a way that makes them think they're entitled to call the shots in his ministry. When there isn't a danger of that, particularly when the gift comes from a church to whom he's not currently ministering, as with the gifts he received from the Philippian church, he's very happy to Accept them. And then there's that great riot in Ephesus led by Demetrius the silversmith. And again, it's couched in religious terms. The great goddess Artemis, her name is being shamed. <laughs> well, let the goddess deal with it if she is one. The real concern, Luke makes it clear, is that the silversmith's union is in danger of going under. They're losing too much money. Wouldn't that be interesting if Christian spending practices really were different enough from those of others that the pornography industry and other such things rioted because uh, (laughs) they were losing ground. 
I think James was written early, and uh, James certainly has a lot to say about rich and poor. There will be a great reversal of those who are poor now but spiritually rich versus those who are rich now but spiritually impoverished. Don't show the favoritism to the person who comes into the assembly and obviously is well-to-do versus the one who is destitute. And intriguingly, that entire half chapter that has had so much theological ink spilled over it since the time of the Reformation about faith without works is dead and can James be harmonized with Paul is introduced in verses 14 to 16 with the example from the world of economics and social position. Suppose a brother or sister lacking daily food and adequate clothing is in your presence and you say, go, be warm, be well fed, but do nothing to help them. Implication, but you could have. What good is that? Can such faith save? And the Greek uses the may with the question to me, no. It's not possible. There seems to be a small middle class among James' audience who are traveling merchants who have the ability to say, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year and make money. And James doesn't condemn the planning. But he does say, but you have not, he does charge them with not having left room for God's will to overrule theirs. Once we make our strategic plans, what would be the mechanism that we would acknowledge was God overruling them? We still listening? And then the very harsh judgment of the well-to-do landlords oppressing large numbers of James' Christian audience who appear to be the poor migrant workers of their day, not giving them daily wages, leaving them unable perhaps to feed their families food for the day. Interesting to read James' commanded response At first glance, it can sound as if he is commanding nothing but patience and prayer and waiting for the second coming. He says in 5, 7 and following, be patient then until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land. You too be patient and stand firm. Don't grumble. But then verse 10 adds... As an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, that's an interesting example. (laughs) Turn randomly almost to any prophet you want where they're speaking in the name of the Lord and they're denouncing injustice. James doesn't command violent revolution, but he's not commanding passivity. And then he goes on to say, uh, you've heard of Job's perseverance and seen what the Lord finally brought about. Yeah, I've, I've also heard Job's perseverance. <laughs> lament after lament, uh, self-vindication, uh, denial that all of his friends' orthodox theology applies in his case. This isn't passivity. And Job's vindicated at the end of the story. We need to speak about these topics. We need to speak out against the injustices of our day. Well, that must be about all there is in the Bible, surely. He can't have another page. Paul? No, 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 no. Paul's the spiritual gospel writer. You don't go to Paul when you want to find biblical social ethics. Maybe we should. 
How about in the midst of all of those debates and councils and gatherings and how do you harmonize Acts and Galatians and is it south or north or before the apostolic council or after it? And the one thing on one occasion they immediately agreed on was that we should remember the poor. That was not controversial. (laughs) Justification by faith was. Wow. Do we reverse it? What about those who were idle in Thessalonica? That's I-D-L-E, not to be confused with Demetrius' idols. And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, the one who is not willing to work shall not eat. That's not a future tense of the verb work. That's a use of the verb to will plus the verb to work. It's not a a broadside against all forms of welfare, but it is a broadside against Christians who refuse to at least make a decent attempt to find work. Have we ever thought about how the amazing potpourri of problems that afflicted the Corinthian church might have been disproportionately caused by the minority of rich people among them. Paul says in 126 to 29, not many of you were rich or well-born or noble, which means a few were. The few that would have owned large enough homes for the house churches to meet in, which perhaps contributed to the factionalism. The... uh, One who was living in sin with his stepmother. And is there any rationale why the church had not intervened other than perhaps he was a well-to-do power broker that they didn't dare challenge? As Bruce Winter and others have argued. Lawsuits in the ancient world were done almost uniquely by rich against the rich. (laughs) Why sue anybody else? You wouldn't get anything. And the weak brother or sister who couldn't dissociate eating meat from idolatrous pagan services was probably the very poor who never ate meat on any regular basis except at the monthly Roman festivals where it was free for worshipers. Profaning the Lord's Supper. Wow. We get a chance to teach this one right on a regular basis. How are we doing? (laughs) What does it mean to partake unworthily? Context of 1 Corinthians 11 is very clear. It's people overeating and overdrinking at the expense of the poor members who don't have enough. I've been in churches, but it's not very often where the pastor says... The only people who need to refrain among Christians from the Lord's Supper are those who are callous and careless and are not willing to change their ways about helping the poor. That might revolutionize a few things. Might put us out of work. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to honor my promise. I'm going to skip down to 2 Corinthians, the single longest teaching passage on giving in the New Testament. And Paul uses the model of the poor Macedonian sacrificial giving to challenge the temptation among the wealthier Corinthian Christians to renege on their promises in giving for the collection. And he appeals to that principle of the manna economy. Not to promote particular percentage of giving, but to, in essence, say, give from your surplus. And those who have more in general, if they're honest, will have a greater surplus to give. Strict mechanisms of accountability with the various people that are going to be traveling with the collection. 
and a promise of some unspecified combination of spiritual and or material rewards. (laughs) Nothing that can be put on a TV screen, $100 back for every dollar you send in. In Romans, he echoes Christ on paying taxes, but we also get a glimpse into the fact that apparently 2 Corinthians 8 to 9 worked. And the Corinthians were pleased to give a generous donation, which Paul is now carrying with him to Judea and to Jerusalem. And Philippians gives us another classic example of how Paul walks that delicate tightrope between coming right out and saying thanks for the gift of money in a way that culturally would have indebted him to return some kind of financial favor to the Philippians. And yet he clearly wants to show his appreciation. One writer has called it his thankless thank you because he never actually comes out and says thanks. First Timothy, an often neglected book on this topic. Oh, perhaps we've heard the bit about the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But just to look at one other bit, interesting sandwich, as it were, in verses 17 to 19. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Skip down to 18, command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, dot, dot, dot. There's the the generous part of the sandwich, the two pieces of bread. But notice the meat in between. Verse 17a, put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. If we have a thought out plan that we've taken to the Lord, that we've talked about with our families, if we have families, and we can say before God, as best as I understand my current situation and his call on my life, I am being generous materially. I am being sacrificial. I I really am giving up something I would like to have that I could choose to have for the sake of helping those who have so little, then I don't have to worry and feel guilty about a nice meal out now and then. As long as my lifestyle doesn't become like the rich man, the rich man Lazarus, for I feast sumptuously all the time. God's good gifts are meant for us to enjoy. He's not calling us to asceticism. He might call a few specific individuals to that, but that's not an across-the-board call. We can be very generous and still have so much, if we're honest, that we can enjoy life. First John echoes some of James' language. And then I'm intrigued as to how the Bible ends. with all the weird and wonderful things we do with the book of Revelation. We get a picture of the great evil end times empire depicted in chapter 17, as uh, Robert Mounts puts it, a blasphemous equation of religion and politics. But then in chapter 18, as the people express lament and woe for the destruction of this empire, it's almost all couched in economic terms. And the things they miss read like the bill of sale from uh, a Roman uh, trading vessel bringing in cargoes of luxury goods from the provinces. And to put it in modern terms, people are crying out in agony because there's nowhere to go to shop anymore. Even eBay is gone. But the Bible ends. Tom Wright has put it so well in his recent work, but 
It was so provocative, it made Time magazine. <laughs> and yet, there shouldn't be anything provocative about it. He just puts things bluntly. He says, the biblical hope is not about dying and going to heaven. It's not about life after death. It's about life after life after death. Heaven is just the intermediate state. The Bible ends with new heavens and a new earth, a recreated cosmos. Our pictures of heaven in the popular media, including sometimes the popular Christian media, are way too impoverished. makes it look boring unless you're really into angels and harps. We're going to have a recreated universe. My summary of Revelation 21-22 is we can have it all. Advertisers, but on God's terms and in his timing. And if we try to do it another way, we'll lose it now and for eternity. Is there any way to summarize this all? I think there is. I think there are five points. They're written in visible ink on the bottom of page four, but in blue scribblings on my notes. Material gifts are, let me try that one again. Material resources are a good gift, are good gifts from God meant to be enjoyed. That's why he wants everyone to have a little Material resources are also one key way in which people's hearts are turned from God. So, what's a mechanism for helping them to play more the positive role than the negative role in our lives? Generous stewardship. Generous giving. So that our hearts don't cling to them. Fourthly, there are extremes of wealth and poverty that are morally inherently intolerable. <laughs> the moment I try to quantify those, I get in trouble. Be different for every person, every age, every place, every circumstances. But it is possible, God knows, He'll help you to know. What is too much? Because some truly have too little. And therefore, finally, the biblical teaching from Genesis to Revelation is that spiritual discipleship and material stewardship are inextricably intertwined. There is no such thing as a saved person who gives nothing of any kind to anybody. So what does that mean for the North Shore? If you thought I was going to come with the formula, forget it. I wrestled with that 30 years ago. It's mostly got to do with the heart. It's mostly got to do with a reminder that what we see around us here is not normal by any stretch of the imagination on even a national standard, much less a global one. It's a call to do what we can and then try to do a little bit more next year and then try to do a little bit more beyond that and Constantly reopen the question and never allow ourselves to get complacent or satisfied. And keep feeling a a healthy rather than an unhealthy gnawing tug of the needs of the world. And to be involved in helping others and see and hear of how they come to the Lord and how they improve their lives and, and rejoice in ways that just buying more stuff can't ever create the same kind of fulfillment. 
As long as it's one of the top priorities in your life and in your ministry and you're constantly assessing things, that's probably the most any of us could hope for. God will show you the specifics. They don't come by formula. They don't come by a percentage. But uh, we want to hear from you. And I believe we're going to have a moderator come up and moderate. So let's have a moderate discussion. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Blomberg. Welcome. Okay. We are going to have questions and answers now. It traditionally has been the privilege of the moderator of the question and answer portion of the afternoon to begin with the first question. So I'll assume that privilege if I may. Sure. And I will ask the first question. I read your book, Neither Poverty Nor Riches, when it came out. It's hard to believe it was nine years ago. And I was struck by two things. Number one, what a wonderful example of biblical theology it is. It really is. Terrific example. Another thing that struck me, and there were others, of course, was that at the end, in the final chapter, you offer your own personal example of giving. And so I want to ask you a question that is perhaps more personal than scholarly to begin with, if I may. And the reason I ask it is there are a number of pastors or future pastors. I'm a current pastor. And when we stand and preach and offer our own example, in some ways it's easier to offer our negative examples than it is to offer positive examples. It's hard for us to say sometimes, I think, follow me as I follow Christ. (laughs) And yet this is an area in which you have a good example. And you don't come out straightforwardly and say this, but in essence there's a sense in which in that section you're saying, Consider following me in this area as I follow Christ. And what I wonder, you talked somewhat about that in the book, how you came to the decision to include that section. Mm -hmm. But for the the benefit of pastors and future pastors and people who teach and offer our own examples sometimes, could you describe the the wrestling that went into writing that particular section Mm -hmm. and how you concluded that the Lord would have you do it? Yeah, thanks. And... It actually wasn't all that hard because early in our married life, we were parts of churches, one in Scotland and one in South Florida, where the pastors of those churches in very appropriate and quiet and unassuming ways uh, from time to time talked about their commitment uh, personally to give uh, approximately 25% of what they earned back to the Lord's work in different ways. And the first time I heard it, I was staggered. I didn't know such people existed in the world. But then I realized I was in Scotland and I was learning all kinds of things about frugality and why... (laughs) why they're called Scots. Um, And so when I saw it in Florida at a well-to-do Southern Baptist church, yes, I was a Southern Baptist for three years. God has a sense of humor. Um, (laughs) I was a Yankee abroad, and then I came to my home country, and they still called me a Yankee. Um, (laughs) the the, The emphasis being the anomaly was that it was Southern not Southern Baptist, but Southern. Um, I had to learn how to pronounce a few things differently, y'all. Um, and he did the same thing, 25%. I go, oh, it can be done in America too? Wow. And, and these were also the years that everybody was taking sides on Ron Siders, rich Christians in an age of hunger, and, and the whole idea of a graduated tithe. And so... Back when we were in doctoral study and not making much money and not seeing any of what we made, it just we were a conduit to pass it on to the university. Um, we said, let's try 10%. Not because we think we have to, but 
lot of people have seen it as a good model, and let's just see if what what CIDR says can actually work uh, on the assumption that someday we'll get a real job. Um, if the income ever goes up beyond cost of living increase, let's try upping the percentage, even if it's just 1% per year. And kind of the positive flip side of George Barnes' frog in the kettle, you do it so gradually you don't notice. And, uh, and it actually works. And you discover it's possible. And if I would never have been challenged to do that without other people telling me they did it and it is possible, well, then maybe I could offer that to some other folks. Good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I, I presume there's a, a microphone somewhere, so if you'd raise your hand, I can... Man in the back. You. Okay. Has the mic. Great. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Over here, too. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm certainly no economist, and I'm sure there are many pastors here who feel the same way. No one of us can be experts on every international issue that we could or, or should be concerned with, but we can, we can certainly work together. We can, at the very least, uh, teach our people that that kind of question is not somehow out of bounds or distraction from preaching the true gospel, that these are all interconnected issues. And in as much as any individual and any pastor and any local congregation can't tackle every one of thousands of such questions around the world, it makes sense for us to tackle those with which we have some natural affinity. Maybe it's because we support a missionary and the missionary brings to us the very specific kind of issue that, that you raise. And so we say, who are our resource people? Who are the economists? Who are the politicians that we can talk to and find out what kinds of, of measures could be taken? What can we do even if it's starting on a, a very small scale to address some of these issues? That's how the uh, whole uh, vision for microenterprise industries around the world got started. And in some places, it, it's thriving and has made a huge difference in people's lives. Here's a situation. I'm not familiar with it, but 
assuming all of that information is true, then it's not working. So I don't have the answer. Uh, it's a brand new situation you confront me with, but if I were with a church that had links people and that was their, their issue, I would want to say this is one way to be involved in the kingdom work of God around the world. Don't tell me it's the social gospel. It's the gospel. And it's a natural outgrowth of our love for the Lord and for neighbor and concern to see people healthy in a holistic way, spiritually and materially. Now, where's our think tank? Who do we need to go to? Let's talk. Let's resource. Let's come up with what could be a practical solution and let's commit to it. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, sort of a pastoral question. Do you think there ever comes that point, given the disparity between rich and poor, where as a pastor or a Christian speaker, we just need to say, hey, there is a gap here. And I think sometimes we're so afraid of legalism, we, we don't want to set some sort of a number or a standard. But on the other hand, we're afraid to just speak out and say maybe we are not good stewards of what God has entrusted. So from a pastoral point of view, how would you address that? A second question that's maybe a little bit related is most of the kind of stewardship and giving uh, in the New Testament, as you've demonstrated, has a lot to do with alleviating the needs of the poor. Um, Whereas if we look at the budgets in our churches, the majority of our giving goes towards serving the needs of the church, um, which are legitimate uh, to pay salaries and rents and so on. uh, But that proportion, again, is a question I would just put to you, how do you assess that, uh, the way our giving is structured now and where it goes as compared to what we see in the New Testament? I've never seen a situation, um, I'm, I'm hardly an, an expert on everything that's ever happened in the world, but um, none of us is. I've, I've never seen a situation where somebody laying down the law, even in a non-legalistic way, and saying, this is too much. Don't anybody disagree with me, and this is the way we're doing it. I don't care what anyone else thinks. <laughs> um, works very well. Uh, it very much is uh, a, an issue of the heart. Um, and so, yeah, there are times when I look at certain proposals of what certain churches or Christians or Christian organizations want to do with some chunk of money and I just say well before God I know I can't justify giving a penny to that can I thereby conclude that I know it's God's will for nobody to go forward with the project probably not you know unless it's funding a strip bar or something it's uh, (laughs) something clear but um if we work with people where they are, if we don't take the dramatic steps, but take the gradual steps, the uh, Baptist General Conference Church we've been a part of for the last 15 years in Denver, at one point um, when we were growing considerably numerically as well as financially, we had always had. One of the reasons we were attracted to join the church was because they had a strong commitment to missions local and abroad, and it was a strong commitment to holistic missions, helping people, body and spirit. And the church had uh, a commitment to a 20% missions budget, which is very generous for a a large church with a large facility and uh, a large staff to have to pay. And at one point, the eldership actually said, you know, we can do even better But the way to do it is to increase over a five-year period by 1% per year until we get to 25%. We got as far as 24%, pastor left, and church went downhill. (laughs) Then it came back up again with a new pastor, and we've never gotten back up beyond 20. But at least there was a model there. Nothing dramatic, nothing that people could suddenly say, oh my, this is a huge new burden, but just very gradual incremental increases 
as long as I sense people's hearts want to move in a good direction, I'm thrilled. After all, which of us can ever do much more than incremental improvement? Hi, thank you so much for this. Um, usually in the context of selling your possessions and giving to the poor, we focus on the rich young ruler, and that was, that was, Jesus, what was what Jesus was telling him. I've been intrigued lately by Luke 12, 33, um, where he also says, sell your possessions and give to the poor, as the possibility of a specific command from Jesus. Um, can you speak to that? And, and yeah, and, and the nice thing, <laughs> the nice thing there for us is he doesn't say all. <laughs> it's an unspecified amount. The other intriguing thing about Luke 12, 33 is that it is a unique verse to Luke in the midst of a long paragraph that is otherwise almost word for word for long stretch identical to Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. And in fact, um, in Luke, verse 33 comes only two verses after 31. And you could have figured that out. Um, And Luke 12, 31 is Luke's parallel to the more famous uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33, seek his kingdom Matthew's version goes on to say, and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well, food, drink, clothing, and so forth. Seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all your material needs will be provided for? Well, all right, there are needs, not greeds. But there have been faithful, godly Christians who have starved to death. Probably millions in the history of the world. At least hundreds of thousands. What can Jesus possibly mean? Well, they are all plural pronouns. Here's where my southern sojourn helps. The better translation is, Y'all seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all of these things shall be provided to y'all. Unless you're in those places where y'all is a singular and all y'all is the plural. (laughs) And uh, Luke's context just reinforces it all the more. Sorry. He's saying, uh, sell y'all's possessions. And y'all give some of it. Sell some of your possessions to the poor. That's how all these things shall be added unto you. When the church corporately seeks God's righteous standards, by definition, that includes helping the poor, and then all things shall be added to the Christian poor because the church will provide it. Wow. Novel thought. Uh, yeah, first, I just want to say thank you. I think this is a uh, huge topic. I've I'm, I'm, uh, been a youth pastor here in the area for, for a year and a half and just finished up Trinity a little bit ago. Uh, I thought coming into this context that uh, materialism would be the vice. Um, but what I found out that the relationship between material and time is very connected. Um, so uh, because time time is... Time is money. Yes. Um, Which chapter? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No. Um, and I'm curious because I'm starting to read uh, a lot of information on the church, getting into more some of the radical literature of, um, of Yoder and Howard Watts, mm-hmm. uh, their relationship between uh, a globalized economy and um, how it is in relation to the state. The only answer that, that most of these uh, guys are moving towards and, and, and uh, becoming more and more attracted to it 
because I feel like I'm constantly running up against this barrier, is subversion. Is the relationship between the state being subverting um, or the church um, as a confessional community subverting the systems that uh, the, private, the privatized churches um, um, are constantly uh, enmeshed with the nationalism, the idolatry that comes with that. I'm looking for a way out, um, and I'm looking for another answer. And uh, I was just wondering if there's any literature you could lead me to to say that subversion was not that answer. <laughs> you know you're in danger whenever people say I'm looking for a way out. Um, <laughs> no, it's a great question. A lot depends on what you mean by subvert. Um, I admit to be very taken as you look at the major Reformation models on issues of church and state by the more radical reformers and the idea of the church modeling as an alternative society in and with a watching world, the standards of God's kingdom. Uh, Denver has, I am told, uh, I haven't attempted to empirically confirm or disconfirm the statistic, for a metropolitan area of our size, the largest number of active evangelical Christian parachurch ministries to the poor, oppressed, marginalized, discriminated against across a whole variety of contexts in our city and to a certain degree in the suburbs as well. And almost all of them have been inspired by the vision that um, the church's task, much as we want to be responsible citizens, much as We have every right and responsibility to take stands on political issues, to select uh, candidates that we vote for. It's not the government that we put our hope in for doing God's will and justice in the world. It's the church. And the church needs to be seen, even as individuals within it, choose or choose not to participate in politics and the whole political process, the church needs to be seen as never closely aligned with any one political party or movement or, or government, but as an alternative, spiritually focused, God-driven um, mechanism for doing God's will in the world. Now, if that's what subversion means, I'm all for it. If subversion means undermining what the government is trying to do, working against it, I don't see any biblical support for that. I see biblical support for refusing to obey commands of governments that flatly violate the will of God, but even that's just a little bit different than, than subversion. Um, I'm, I'm very open to the idea of let's create, as Denver has, an inner city health center that is Christian run and financed. It doesn't take a cent of government money. It witnesses to the gospel. It has a chaplain. And it gives nothing free. Even if you pay a few cents, it's on a sliding scale of fees based on your last pay stub and what you can or can't afford to pay. It's thoroughly Christian. It started a couple of years before we moved to Denver. It recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. It's had phenomenal impact in the area. I'm all for that. I wish we had them all over the place. But... As uh, Arthur Simon with Bread for the World a few years ago once put it, all the churches doing all these social welfare, quote-unquote, work in the country still give one one-hundredth the amount the federal government does. 
So don't tell us you don't want the government to be doing it until you're ready to fill the gap and give 100 times as much. (laughs) Or we really will leave people in our wake. And we've got about two minutes. So one very quick question if someone has one question. Or I'll give a really quick answer and then we can have two. Yes. (laughs) Yes, the harder question is, can you own it? (laughs) Sure you can. And uh, the one pastor in South Florida who modeled 25% giving drove an amazingly fancy Cadillac. And if anybody asked, it was given to him free. <laughs> and it was fairly old also, but still in good shape. So, yeah, when, when uh, was it Tony Campolo a few years ago who said, uh, you can't be a Christian, drive a BMW. Um, yours is just a, a variant of that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a ridiculous thing to say other than to hyperbolically make a point, which is the way Tony usually makes his points. Um, <laughs> But um, the the question would be, why are you doing it? Are you doing it because you got a great deal and it's free and it, or dirt cheap and it runs well and and you'd really be paying more to buy a different car and substitute it? Or, Or is there some other equally legitimate reason? Or are you doing it because I like to be seen driving this car? Was that a one minute or a two minute answer? That's a great answer. <laughs> no matter how long. Oh, wow. Okay.